Hello, so this video is going to be, I guess, kind of not necessarily debunking, but analyzing some of the flaws in some of the more common Christian apologetics arguments. Um, I would like to state, technically, these arguments can be applied to other religions. I wouldn't necessarily say that they could be applied to all religions, but could technically apply to any religion with a god, which is questionable when it comes to like Buddhism and Jainism and stuff. But generally these arguments could be applied to any like stereotypically monotheistic religion. Um, however, the reason I specify Christian here is because these are really common um, and popular arguments in Christian apologetics. And before I get into any of it, uh, I do want to say, I don't think people are stupid for using this argument. There are plenty of very smart theologians and Christians uh, who use these arguments. However, I don't think um, that they hold up even when they're used by people in more intellectual contexts than just someone typing it in an Instagram comment. Either way, they're flawed regardless of how much or how little detail is put into them. Um, if you would like a second part, if this video does well um, on other Christian apologetics arguments, I would love to do that. But I'm sticking with these three here because they're kind of, I, I don't know for sure if they're the most common, but they're the most common that I see. And also I think are more substantial than a lot of other Christian apologetics arguments. That's not to say that they're good, but that they do have some like grounding. Like they, I understand why someone would find this a good argument, even if I do not think that's the case. Whereas some other apologetics arguments, I'm just like, I don't even know how the hell you think that that makes sense, but I guess whatever. But with these, I can like understand why someone would find them compelling, even if I disagree. So uh, let's just get into it. So the first argument that I'm going to touch on is the Kalam cosmological argument. Now there is more than one kind of cosmological argument. It is kind of a category of, um, of apologetics concepts. Uh, however, I'm specifically talking about the Kalam cosmological argument here. It has two premises with a conclusion um, that I honestly don't think adds up to God and has a misunderstanding. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Conclusion, the universe has a cause. Now, I think this immediately to anyone who's not religious would invoke the idea of Maybe it does have a cause, but how does that at all prove God? The cause could be an infinite number of things and it, none of them have to be God. And a lot of them make more sense or require less leaps in logic than God. And I definitely agree with this. There are plenty of um, other explanations for this. However, I think that this argument has a fundamental misunderstanding of the concept of kind of like the Big Bang and the start of the universe and everything that goes along with that. I do like about this argument that it is sort of, um, I guess not inherently, but is often used as like an old earth creation or used by Christians who do believe in science and the Big Bang and stuff like that. Because a lot of the times I hear it used as a, oh, well, something started the Big Bang or God was the reason that it happened or God led it to this place. And while I think that that is a much more reasonable assumption than like young earth creationism, there is still not any proof for it. I, I'm glad that it's often used by people who do align themselves with scientific facts, but I just don't see why God is needed in that. And again, it also kind of misunderstands the Big Bang, because we don't necessarily know that the Big Bang is the beginning of the universe. In fact, we do kind of have an assumption that it is older than what we can trace it back to. The Big Bang is simply an expansion from an infinitely small point. It is essentially where our laws, the, the farthest back we can trace back in the Big Bang through cosmic microwave background radiation and other things is essentially before that point is where our concept of physics breaks down and we are no longer able to measure anything accurately or really at all because our understanding of physics no longer applies before that point. And there are a million hypotheses on what is before that point. Um, some more accepted than others, some theoretically possible, but still pretty ridiculous. Some that work in math, but seem so absurd that they're really not worth considering regardless of what 
that is. Um, I am not a physicist, so I'm not going to like go into details on it. I'll leave some um, videos about it in the description if anyone's interested, but that's not necessarily the start of the universe. That is where we start being able to measure things, where our laws of physics that we understand them to be start applying, and as such, we are able to like notice them, to measure them. <laughs> So the second premise has the issue that we actually don't know that the universe began to exist. Um, if our laws of physics no longer apply before that point, we do not know that cause and effect applies. We also don't know that there's not some kind of infinite cycle of this, which is often called the big crunch. We don't know that it didn't come from a white hole, which I'll leave a video about. That's one of the theories that's kind of, well, hypotheses, that's kind of ridiculous, but mathematically works. We, we don't know that it has a cause or that it began to exist both of those are flawed because whatever begins to exist has a cause relies on our current laws of physics which does not apply before we can measure any information about the big bang and the universe began to exist also we don't know that we just can trace it back so far and know that it's expanding but we don't know what happened before it started expanding and we don't know what happened in those first couple thousand million whatever years before we were able to measure it. So both of these premises, while seeming common sense and seeming like they're a pretty logical position to come to, actually aren't scientific facts um, when it applies to this area of science. We simply don't know if the universe began to exist and we don't know if cause and effect applied before our ability to measure the Big Bang. And I mean, again, even if um, even if the premises were true, it still doesn't necessarily lead you to God. It could lead you to a million other things that we just don't know. And that's simply taking a God of the gaps argument and saying, well, something had to create the universe, so why not God? It doesn't prove God. It's simply, well, un assuming that the other things I just talked about for four minutes weren't true, would just prove that the universe began to exist, which is already, yeah, I talked about that. <laughs> The next one I want to touch on is Pascal's wager. This is an older argument from a mathematician uh, from the 17th century. Most people probably know who he is. If not through this argument, then through math class. Um, the argument is that a rational person should live as though God exists and seek to believe in God. If God does not exist, such a person will only have a finite loss, some pleasures, luxuries, etc., where if God does exist, he stands to receive infinite gains as represented by an eternity in heaven or other afterlifes to avoid infinite losses and eternity in hell, um, or in some religions, just lack of afterlife. <laughs> now, there's a few issues with this, some of which I am rather annoyed I don't see brought up. Um, now, first of all, I do want to say when this argument is used, this is the full version of the argument actually made by Pascal himself. However, the argument usually used by Christians is not this full argument and does not include um, that you will have finite losses in life. It usually goes something along the lines of, if I believe in God and I'm wrong, I lose nothing. If you don't believe in God and you're wrong, you lose everything. So that kind of simplified version of it, I feel like is not as strong of an argument as the initial one, although I have issues with the actual original argument made by Pascal, because it refuses to acknowledge the things that are lost in your life by being religious, um, which I've talked about in a bunch of videos from arbitrary restrictions, mental health issues, forced abstinence, people who go on to be a part of religious, um, like pastors, priests and nuns, whatever, um, obviously are losing things, which is represented in the original argument. But I just wanted to point out that the way I hear this argument used, that is not usually acknowledged. So I wanted to throw that in there. However, for the actual original argument itself and the way it's used by either religious scholars or Pascal himself um, has quite a few issues. First of all, which God? Okay, there's various gods, various religions. That is an understatement. And this argument could be used by one religious person to another religious person. And some of these religions are mutually exclusive. Like, they're literally Christians have a whole thing against idol worship. So you can't just believe in all the gods just in case because some of those gods do not allow you to believe in other gods, otherwise, hell. So if that wasn't a factor, I guess you could be like, every religion is real, every god is real, I worship all of them. But unfortunately, some of those religions say, if you worship any god other than me, you go to hell. 
So that doesn't work. And then you have the whole issue of, well, which religion is it? And then maybe considering which religion has the worst punishment for not believing or whatever. Um, and there's also religions that don't think that you will suffer if you don't believe in them. That's, for example, Judaism, right? Like Ju Judaism, as far as I'm aware, does not believe that if you are not Jewish, you will go to hell or whatever. Judaism doesn't even have a concept of hell. So if you're Jewish, this argument doesn't apply because, first of all, you don't have to be Jewish to go to heaven. And second of all, there is no hell. So this argument doesn't even work in that religion. This argument assumes that Christianity is the only option whenever there are other religions, unlike Judaism, that do have their own concept of hell or whatever, or religions like Buddhism, where you can end your reincarnation cycle or whatever. So it would really come down to uh, which one has the worst possible outcome if I don't believe it. And that still leaves you with a bunch of other bad possible outcomes from other religions. <laughs> not to mention the fact that it's intellectually dishonest. Um, I I'm not just going to believe in God just in case. Um, and, and the fact that you can't force yourself to believe something. I mean, I know this says you should live as though God exists. However, in Christianity, that doesn't really apply. I mean, there is an argument on different um, denominations of Christianity on faith with works versus faith without works. Um, and that is a very heavily disagreed upon thing among different Christian denominations. However, on the ones where it's faith without works, if you don't genuinely believe in God and you're just believing in God just in case, I don't think that the Christian God sounds like the kind of guy who'd be like, yeah, I know you didn't really believe in me and you just kind of wanted to cover your own back, but that's good enough for me. He doesn't, I don't know, that doesn't seem like it's very in character for him. So overall, Pascal's wager does not acknowledge the existence of other religions or religions with different concepts of afterlifes that may have different consequences. And it also relies upon dishonesty and something that's pretty much impossible, which is to force yourself to believe something. And only when used in its kind of common Instagram comment type way, as opposed to the actual argument, um, the way it's used kind of colloquially as opposed to academically, often neglects to acknowledge the fact that you do miss out on things due to being religious, particularly Christian. Um, and while that's not actually a problem with the real argument, it is a problem with the way it is most commonly used. Now, the next one is kind of a category of arguments. Um, there are, uh, it's the teleological slash fine tuning argument. There are a variety of ways that this is explained. One of the most common ones being the watchmaker analogy. But essentially, the teleological argument is the idea that the universe is fine-tuned for us to live here. That if things were even slightly different, if physics, if chemistry, if whatever worked slightly different, we would not be allowed to exist. Or if the planet that we live on didn't have the exact conditions that it does, we would not exist. And therefore, the universe is fine-tuned to our existence, and that is so insurmountably unlikely that there must be someone there to have fine-tuned it that way manually as opposed to it occurring by chance. And this is also explained um, in a slightly different version of this argument called the watchmaker analogy, which essentially is you're walking on the beach, you find a watch on the ground. You pick up that watch, it's complex, it obviously has things that work in a certain way that allow it to function um, and you pick that up and obviously you're going to assume, oh, well, someone had to have made this. This didn't just naturally fall into place like this. And this is also used with an analogy of like a Coca-Cola can that it wouldn't just materialize in a way that it says Coca-Cola and is red and has soda in it and it's drinkable and stuff like it's used in a lot of ways. But the Coca-Cola and watchmaker arguments tend to be the most common analogies used for this. But it essentially boils down to every single criteria in the universe was created to allow for our existence, therefore someone had to create it because that couldn't arise by chance. And I have quite a few issues with fine tuning. The first one I want to touch on is the fact that if we didn't exist, we wouldn't be able to realize this. And in a universe with different physics or chemistry or whatever, um, there may be a different type of life that is thinking the exact same thing because that version of the universe, that version of physics or chemistry or whatever, did allow for that type of life to exist, but not us, and therefore would be thinking that we have a sample size of one, of one planet that allowed for life, of one universe that allowed for life. So we don't know if another set of reality, essentially, another understanding of science would allow for life. It very well could, and it might not, and there are probably versions of it that would, and probably versions that wouldn't. 
And this also, whenever this is used in regards to the planet as opposed to the universe, this also neglects to realize that how massive the universe is and how unlikely it is that we are alone. And the fact that our range of where we can ever go in the universe without some form of wormhole or whatever, even with light speed transportation, would not allow us to exit the local group. So we have a limited scope of a tiny portion of the entire universe, like an insurmountably small amount of space that we can access, meaning that there could be life in every other galaxy group that we would never be able to access because the universe is expanding too quickly for us to ever reach them or for them to reach us. And that life in those other areas that may potentially exist that we will never be able to access may be thinking the exact same thing about their planet and they may not be carbon-based life. There's the most uh, common assumption that if there is non-carbon-based life, it's silicon-based life, but we honestly don't know. But that life that may be completely unrecognizable as living to us or may be completely out of our realm of comprehension in terms of perceiving it as life they may be thinking the same thing. I'm so lucky I am on this gas giant planet and I have all of these completely different ways that my body works. And I'm so lucky that I'm in this completely different environment, but that it was specifically made for me to be allowed to exist. Um, and we're thinking the same thing. Well, maybe that potential other life is in a completely different environment than us. And of course, that's all hypothetical, right? But the whole point is this is hypothetical, that you're making assumptions. Um, and we have a sample size of one planet with life, one universe with life, one galaxy with life, whatever. So there's really no good way to tell if it is fine-tuned to us. And this also leads me on to the next thing, is that the universe and the planet itself actually isn't very hospitable to life. If the universe was fine-tuned for our existence, if the planet was fine-tuned for our existence, why is the vast majority of the planet completely inaccessible to the point where we have gone into space more times than the deepest parts of the ocean, um, where we know more about space than the deepest parts of the ocean? Why is the vast majority of our planet inhospitable to us? Um, and for the most part, unable to be used. I mean, it's not like we're dropping fishing lines into the bottom of the Mariana Trench. So why is most of our planet completely useless to us if it was made solely for humans? Not to mention, why is the rest of the universe, first of all, so big? Why is it so fucking massive if we can't leave the local group? Why is there the rest of the universe when we are unable by the laws of physics to leave our galaxy group? Why would the rest of that exist? Why would a god waste time creating that rest of the universe that is completely inaccessible to us in any conceivable manner. Um, but if it was made for us, that, that just seems like a waste of time and energy. What is the point of that? Not to mention the fact that we have to go to extreme lengths of technology to even get people like into low Earth orbit, let alone outside of Earth or Earth's orbit at all, let alone to the moon, that we haven't even gone beyond the moon with a living person. Why is the rest of that so inhospitable? Why isn't it just a universe-sized planet that's all made for us, then it really doesn't, it's not fine-tuned for us because it's massively inhospitable to pretty much all forms of multicellular life. <laughs> well, not pretty much all, all, form, all forms of multicellular life. Like, why is it so inhospitable if it was made for us? And why is there so much of it that is unable to be accessed due to the laws of physics pretty much forever, pretty conclusively? that we can't access if it was made for us, why would they make something for us that we can never access? This argument just neglects to acknowledge the fact that the universe actually really isn't hospitable for us, that the planet is not hospitable for us. It neglects to acknowledge that we have a sample size of one, so we actually don't know if another universe would allow for life. It very well might. We don't know if other planets might be hospitable for life. It very well might. It probably is. That's like doing like a medical study of a drug on one person and that one person gets better and you go, oh, okay, well, we should give this medication to everyone now because it worked for one person. And then you find out, oh, maybe that one person got better on their own and people are dying from this or whatever, right? Like a sample size of one is not a good, um, solid reason to believe in something. And I don't see why this should be any different. Just because we're incapable of acquiring other samples does not mean that the sample size of one is sufficient.
And also in regards to the watchmaker argument specifically, this neglects to acknowledge the lack of flaws in a man-made item um, and the flaws that are in nature. Um, disregarding everything I just said, well, more so like including it, disregarding the fact that those things are clearly not made with us in mind. What about vestigial organs? What about cancer? What about genetic diseases? What about radiation causing gene mutations? What about our immune system attacking itself and causing people to die not from the virus or bacteria that they have, but from the immune system itself? Why does our body function in a way that is not like clockwork, like they would say? Why are there so many flaws and issues and leftover things if we were created intelligently with a purpose. I mean, you look at a watch and whether it's aesthetic or functional, every part of that watch has a purpose and there is no piece of it that's like, there's no extra gear inside of a watch just sitting there that doesn't do anything and sometimes like causes your abdomen to give you sepsis, right? Like that's not a thing. Um, like sure, there may be flaws in some of them, but it's very clear that they are made with intent um, which is not the case for human or any other life due to the flaws that arose by it coming about naturally. And that's not even to mention the fact that evolution already explains this. And while sometimes this argument is used as a God-guided evolution as opposed to young Earth creation argument, um, I do more see it often used as a young Earth creation argument, in which case it neglects to acknowledge the mountains of evidence that that is not what happened. Um, so a lot of issues with that one. I think I spent like half the video talking about that, honestly, I'm pretty sure. But uh, yeah, those are the three I'm going to do today. If anyone is interested in me addressing any other um, apologetics arguments, feel free to let me know in the comments um, or give me some suggestions for arguments you want me to cover or arguments that you think are more compelling than these or whatever. Um, I'll probably only be doing that if this video does well or someone gives me one that I really, really want to talk about that I didn't think about. Um, if someone uses one of these arguments, feel free to send them this video. Uh, I will have timestamps in the description, and if I can figure out how chapters work, I'm not sure how to do that, then maybe I'll have that uh, for which argument I'm talking about. But for now, thanks for watching. Uh, have a great week, guys. I will see you next week. Hada. I stare at the populace in prayer